Okay. Um, we can start the Transportation Advisory Board meeting for October 9th. Um, call to order. Uh, can we go ahead and do a roll call? Chair Lehner. Here. Board Member Bennett. Here. Board Member Wicklin. Here. Vice Chair Christ. Present. Board Member Kim. Here. Okay. Uh, we can move to, um, I know on the meetings from the last uh, meetings we have, uh, Board Member McInerney uh, offered some edits, I believe. Is there anybody else on the board that has any um, notes on the September meeting minutes that they would like to put into the record? Okay. Then can we move for an approval of the minutes of the September meeting? So moved. I need actually a motion first. Oh, okay. I move. A second? second. Board member Kim seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Approved. Okay, we can go to uh, item four communications from staff. Uh, Phil Greenwald, go ahead. Whoa. Great, we've got a couple things for you tonight. Um, we just wanted to tell you a little bit about what's going on. Um, let me just make sure we're still on board with signal work on Main Street. Yes, we actually just started uh, camera poles today. Um, so our contractor's currently pulling wire for our new camera systems. We're starting at um, the south end of town at Pike and moving our way north. Uh, we'll integrate the first uh, three sections. So it'll be Pike, Quail, and Quebec. Um, test out the new system, make sure it's running properly before we uh, switch ever over everything through the Main Street Corridor. Oh, that was, I'm not seeing anyone. You want me to talk about it? I've got the list. Yeah, can you talk about it? Okay. Um, just uh, um, if you've on, been on Main Street in the last week or so, you can uh, see that uh, at the mid-block crossings. On the 300, 400, and 500 block, we have installed RRFBs, the uh, rapid rectangular flashing beacons. Um, so we have, uh, we're still uh, observing those, making sure that for the majority of, of the users that they have enough adequate time to cross. Uh, while we were testing them, we noticed that a couple of elderly residents seem to be, uh, um, when they delayed crossing, um, didn't hit it right away, they, uh, they ran out a little bit of time. So we're still keeping an eye on those and, and we can adjust those if we need to add a, add a little bit more time. So that's kind of a work in progress as that moves forward. Um, next item is uh, we have been working on 3rd Avenue for about a year and a half now. Um, we are coming to uh, um, kind of a closure on, on part of the road um, from about Sherman East. Uh, we just finished up the uh, kind of repaving. Uh, we've added most of the, the new signs, uh, some of the crossings. We put stop control in at Sherman and Francis. Um, the, uh, we've also got some, some flashing uh, speed limit signs uh, to note that those s signs will now enable us to collect data on the, that road. So we will have real-time data of what the speeds actually are and if the improvements are actually working. Um, the section from Sherman to the west will be delayed. Uh, paving will be undertaken next year. Uh, in part because at the 3rd and Sherman intersection, we are working on a storm drainage project. A project uh, was out to bid. It's been late in design, uh, but bids are in there within our budget. So we anticipate moving that forward in the next several months. And then spring of next year, the first project we will undertake is finishing up 3rd with repaving. And with that, I'll turn it over to Phil for microtransit. Oh, I wish you would have said that. <laughs> Um, I wasn't going to talk much about microtransit, but we, uh, you, you know enough, I think, as a board that we did receive the dollars from RTD. So we're very excited about that. We've actually had some meetings with them now to do the, um, the next round, which is really the intergovernmental agreements to start that money flowing. So we are still on track right now to have those dollars in place before the, uh, or by the first of the year, and then we'll be able to hopefully go out to bid early in 2024 and then have hopefully something running uh, within that first, probably the beginning of the second quarter, I would say, 
April-ish. We just want to start when it's good weather. I, th I think we've told that to you before as well. So it's a little repetitive, but I just want to let you know that we're still on track for that. I also wanted to talk a little bit um, about Kaufman Street, unless there's some things on microtransit that you have questions about. But otherwise, on Kaufman Street, that uh, project, which runs basically from 1st Avenue north to 9th Avenue, busway, bikeway, new walk, new roadway, uh, is on track to go to uh, bid, uh, I believe, next month. So we are still on track to do that as well. Just a reminder that if anybody's listening out there in, in the wide, wide world of, of Longmont here, that uh, 2024, 25, and 26 are going to be rough years for construction. Just to remind everybody that we've got a We've got some things in place. We think microtransit will help with some of that. So that's going to be good that that'll be in place before we really get going in our construction schedule. We've got a couple of other ideas uh, working with the LDDA on some thoughts of how to get around some of the parking issues as well. So um, we're hopeful that with that project moving forward and the perceived loss of parking, people believe it's a loss of parking, but when only 40, 30% use the parking, yeah, we're losing parking spaces, but are we losing the capacity. Anyway, I won't go into that, but just to let you know that those things are kind of going on. And finally, well, two more things. We're also working with uh, more of a regional aspect. We're working with the city and county of Broomfield, Westminster, city of Westminster, city of Lafayette, Louisville, Erie, Boulder, and Boulder County uh, to talk about e-bike share for the whole region, for this whole region. So that would look like um, if you've been in Boulder and seen B-Cycle in Boulder, they've got all electric bikes for their for their um, for, for the for that e-bike share. That's what it is. It's all e-bikes, so um, that's been a good conversion from them. They've seen amazing growth. We had the B-Cycle folks in town. We gave them a tour of kind of our bike facilities. They got very excited. A couple of them wanted to move here, so that was exciting too. Um, we'll see if they actually um, move here from Wisconsin. I doubt it, but. Uh, they were pretty excited about the weather and everything and the different facilities that we have. So that was exciting. I think there's a lot of positive things moving forward with that bike share too. Hopefully that can get off the ground in the first quarter, second quarter of next year as well. So I know we've had some issues with other bike share companies in the past uh, and with COVID, that kind of was the death knell for, um, I hate to say that, sorry. Um, but that was kind of the end for bike share for the city of Longmont. We were doing okay, um, but we were lacking sponsors. So this e-bike share kind of runs on its own and does its own thing, and, and um, they have self-supporting funding sources. So um, it's been a much better conversation so far. So just want to give you as the T Transportation Advisory Board a heads up of what's going on in those different pieces. If there are any questions about, okay, yes, sir. With the B-Cycle program, there's not scooters, because I know in Boulder that's a big issue with those scooters, just kind of, so the B-Cycle is it uh, it's kind of station to station bike sharing? Right, they are uh, dependent on the on the stations for the charging of the bicycles, so they don't take them out, charge them, and put them back on the road. They're charged every time they're put back into a station, and that's pretty critical to the operation. The idea of the scooters was uh, something that was uh, not forwarded by our city council a number of years ago, about two years ago. So um, that's a different company, which is good too. So we're just going to uh, talk about the B-cycle model at this point and not worry about the scooter model unless there's pressures in the future. We do know that there's a likely change in council coming up in November. So with that change, we may be asked to bring that issue back, but we aren't going to push it at the staff level. So with the B cycle setup, it is kind of electric station to electric station. Right, there'd have to be a number of stations. And what B cycle was doing with their tour around the city was to find places that they thought were good, good, good uh, locations for this bike share system to be anchored and, and dock. The docking stations would be placed. Fantastic. It's very similar to the one before, but I'm trying not to mention names, but uh, <laughs> Zagster and Pace were the two. Uh, they were the same company, just trying to, they were trying to change into a e-bicycle e model as well. But uh, anyway, those docking stations are pretty critical for this to work out, right? And it does clean it up a little bit more so the bicycles aren't just 
being parked on sidewalks anywhere. They, they have to be put away in order for you to stop paying. Bill, any idea how many stations it's gonna take for docking stations for the bikes? That's a great question. I do know when I look at the Boulder model, there are a large number of stations. So um, I think they started talking about um, at least 10, starting with 10 stations with 10 bicycles each, so the 100, but I think that their ideas go much higher than that, go into the 200 to 300 bike components, so 30 stations maybe. But I have no, that's just my guess and that's not a number from them yet, so. Is this something that we would build and how much, like how much space does it take? Um, they're, you know, for 10 bikes, um, just think of 10 bike racks in a row and that's kind of the same they're a little closer spaced actually mm -hmm. because you can kind of fit them in. They're meant to fit in into a tighter space. But um, we have some pads from the old bike share that uh, are still out there. So I'm sure that those could be easily reused. We looked at some other places around town and they thought they could find some um, pretty good locations that might be a little tight. They can also angle them and change them. They don't have to all be the same configuration. So you can angle them to get more, more bikes in as well. So. We'll see what they do. You know, this is a this is kind of ongoing coordination, and again, we're working with a number of other entities around this area, and so we're all going to have to get on the same page with a with a intergovernmental agreement. Yeah, the integration, you know, is a little tricky because um, are they mostly trying to connect with microtransit, or are they considering RTD routes at all in this? I think their big consideration is RTD routes and seeing that there's a bus rapid transit component coming mm -hmm. online by 2026. Uh, so there's a, you know, there's a, a major project with the raise grant and we just kind of finalized all the programming of dollars for 119. And so those buses should go online in 2026. We all have, we have our buses that are currently running in town now, that last mile connection. And if everybody, kind of had the same, was using the same application, the same app in all these different areas. We think that that brings a lot of merit to the idea of one company kind of covering the whole group. So that's, mm -hmm. that's one of the things we're looking at. And of course, there's a lot of procurement issues with that. So uh, we have to be careful of going after just one company. So that, that's what we're talking about right now is how, how we go about doing a proposal my concern with that is a lot of uh, RTD is very centralized. And so once again, the east side needs more transportation. And I think the west side does too. And just those edges of town, you know. Right, and the, other, uh, the idea is to get docking stations out in those western and eastern edges of town as well so that if you do need to take a bus into mm -hmm. downtown, you can get to those you edges. can start with a bike and yeah. then you work your way in. Right. Yeah. yeah, which is what I <laughs> Or work your do. way back out. Yeah, yeah, however you're traveling. And then, again, with that micro transit kind of overlay over the whole thing where you can just kind of get on an app and order a ride, uh, hopefully for under $2, most likely under $2, if not just a yeah. dollar, and, and get anywhere in town on that. So. And there's going to be bike racks on those micro transit, at least for two bikes, do you think? I think so, but I'm not sure if you'll want to put an electric bike on there because they're going to be a little right. heavier than they a are, typical yeah. bike. So yeah. uh, we'll have to think about all these things. Yeah. Yeah. So integration. Interesting. Yeah. Thanks. One last item that I have for you all, which is kind of important, and I may have wanted to put this in the uh, the bulk of the agenda, but I um, we're just trying to push this a little faster than I think we thought originally, and. Um, uh, you know, Dave, uh, Dave McInerney was part of the group that selected a consulting firm for the transportation mobility plan. Uh, he's not here tonight, but he did. A, he really helped us find the right folks, and we ended up going with a company called Fair and Peers. And so they're gonna they're gonna be doing our transportation mobility plan in the future, and that's gonna start up. We want to start up before uh, the end of the year. In fact, we want to do a kickoff this month. So the tough thing to ask and. I know there's a number of other boards asking tonight as well and this week um, for a project steering committee member, a volunteer to be on our project steering committee. And I can tell you a little bit about 
kind of what is expected. I hope to be able to tell you a little bit about that. But um, let's see. Probably forgot my sheet. But anyway, I just want to let you know that it's um, it's it's going to likely meet four times during our year-long process. So uh, quarterly, we'll meet quarterly. Um, probably about two hour, maybe longer for some, shorter for others, but averaging about two hours per meeting. And the project committee will be, or the project steering committee will be asked to review existing conditions for the transportation mobility plan along with the draft vision and goals. So that'll be one aspect of the project. Participate in a charrette to discuss the draft recommendations. Participate in an interactive workshop to shape project prioritization through various applications, such as story maps and all these different things that we're gonna send out to the public. So it'll be the steering committee's review of that public outreach to kind of come back to the TMP. And then finally, review the updated draft recommendations, priorities, and implementation strategies and provide final input. So those are the four meetings and that's what we're asking for. So if, uh, if you'd like to decide as the five of you uh, to, uh, to pick one member, and it might be somebody who's not here, but uh, I'll leave that up to you. <clears throat> well, I'm willing to, but if anybody else on the board would like to, let's we can go ahead and go start with Garrison and come come all the way across here. I am not interested. Oh. Uh, yeah, for once I'm gonna say no. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm. You know, I got I got a lot of things going on. I can't participate this time either, but um, I would say David might be interested also. <laughs> You're good. Uh, no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I guess I'll, I'll be first, and then if David wants to, I'll ask him. Thank you very much. That's all we needed tonight from the communications from staff, thank you. Oh, we got one more. We're on it. So um, if you've uh, you know been out and about uh, this week, you'll notice the leaves are starting to change. Uh, it's a little cooler in the morning. So that means that operations is gearing up for snow season. So each year, working with uh, communications, we uh, publish a snow savvy guide, um, which um, I wanted to provide for you for information. Um, no need to look through it now. You're more than happy to answer, you know, nail us with any questions uh, for the next meeting or at the next meeting. Uh, it's got a lot of good information in it. Um, talks about uh, kind of the miles of roadway, the miles of roadway we plow, uh, the core objectives uh, in line with our goals. Um, it's got uh, some of our uh, information on our anti-icing uh, in conjunction with plowing. Um, some of the tools, the tech tools we use to forecast storms as well as the live street cameras we look to observe conditions. Um, and then uh, just some of the snow routes, it's got a uh, area on bicycling and snow operations as well. So, um, and one of the other items is uh, shoveling sidewalks. Uh, there's city code that all you know, property owners that front have a sidewalk on their frontage are required to, to, to uh, clear the snow off of their sidewalks. Um, and, uh, and then also some information on reporting problems. Um, we know with our operations that there are some, some hot spots we, we keep a track of uh, that we, uh, after we've, we uh, kind of do some of our plowing operations, uh, the second level is to go back and hit some of the hot spots with ice um, where we have plowed in some streets, some low lying drainage areas that collect and with the melting uh, builds up ice. So um, it isn't just, you know, there's, there's a lot of activity after the storm uh, is completed that we uh, we work on as well. So we wanted to provide that for you for information. Um, and then I'll turn it back over to Phil. Now we have nothing further <laughs> from staff. Thank you. Yeah, is there any questions from the board on the snow savvy? I, I do have one quick one. Will this be website posted as well? Section on the website or? Yes, yeah. I believe it is. There is a snow section in the city's website yep. and we do post this information and we print up a couple hundred of these and, and put them in city buildings for distribution as well. Um. Jim, 
We have a lot of trails up on the northeast side, and I notice they're not on the bicycle and snow operation map. But occasionally they do get plowed, and sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't. But um, there's a lot of people who use that for transportation of one kind or another. So trails um, falls under our Parks and Rec group. Okay. So if there are areas where you feel they should be plowed either at a, at a higher level or um, don't get plowed, you can call the service works number uh, that is on the... I, I guess what I'm what talking about when I say um, trails, I mean um, the fairly large sidewalks that people bicycle and walk on to get through, um, say, along the Ute, Ute Creek golf course. Right. And, those, yeah. are, those are trails that fall under Parks and Rec. Okay. And they have, a, they have a separate operation. I think they do some of the downtown areas, um, but uh, I'm not, not exactly sure what their priority is. Um, I could probably dig up. They have a map that I recall of their operations as well. I could probably dig that up and get that to you um, offline, uh, send it to the whole board as well as a follow-up. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay, it doesn't look like we have anybody from the public here to speak. No? Okay. So I guess the moment we've all been waiting for, or no? Yeah. Crash report? We want to start with that? All right, City of Longmont 2023 Annual Crash Report. Um, it says 2023, but this is the time frame. It is a five-year uh, compilation of data. It is the 2018 to 2022 time frame. Uh, main reason is it takes us the better part of a year to collate all this data. Um, some of that, that includes uh, going through accident reports one by one to pull in some of the circumstances of those uh, those. Uh, accidents, crashes, um, and um, so we usually bring it back to in front of and release it this time of year. I think we're ahead of last year's schedule, so that's a positive thing. Um, general crash information, we all, all can acknowledge, I think nationwide deaths, have uh, we've heard it in the news, have increased. Um, coming from a federal website, uh, the, there's about 42, 43,000 deaths in 2021. Uh, that's a 10.5 increase from the previous year. Um, in 2022, Colorado had 745 deaths. Um, what's, what's critical to know in those numbers, that is an increase as well, but 36% of those were outside of the vehicle. Those were peds and bikes. So over a third of the accidents in Colorado involved pedestrians and bikes. Um, in Longmont, 2021, um, we had eight fatalities. Um, I noted that because in last year's uh, report, we showed seven. Uh, but since that time, uh, the uh, State Patrol has, has provided us information um, on one of the roads within the city. Uh, it is a, still a state facility, but they, they added one more fatality. So we wanted to bring that, that to light um, on that. In, in 2022, there were seven. Uh, 2023, to date, we've seen three fatalities in the city. So why a crash report? What's the importance of it? Why do we, why do we, why do, we do it? Um, for the most part, it helps identify locations and areas concerned. Um, I know, you know, locations or intersections, areas concerned. We've added some, some items, uh, more data in this report uh, to show segments of roadway where we, we, we might have not, you see one accident every now and again, but it was, as we see some of those larger segments, um, we wanted to, to, to make sure that data gets, gets included. Uh, it guides our future work and priorities. Um, and the trends can demonstrate success or a need for additional work. One of the success stories I'll note, and I've repeat, this is maybe repetitive, but the intersection of, of Main, Main or 287 and Pike Road, wherein a you know, number of years ago we saw an uptick in accidents. Uh, we looked at it, uh, we did some, said some changes to the signal, and then when we brought the Pike Road project in, we added even more changes to it. Now that, that intersection is dropped off of the, the, the high accident uh, list. Um, transparency uh, is, is another reason. And then we also assist when public inquiries. Um, 
staff is is when we get calls from the public. We usually, you know, we, we get here from the press. Um, how many accidents? What's the history at this at this intersection? Gives us a, a, a quick tool. We can go in and pull that data rather quickly, rather than going back into the database and and kind of trying to have a to root around. So in this crash report, it's going to be a little bit different than last year's. Um, we have removed the indexing from the report. Um, whereas before we, we kind of were showing uh, and rating intersections at with an index of kind of and a formula uh, that called for anything greater than the number one would, would have been kind of a higher rate we'd start looking at and then below one. We just listed the data pretty much in raw form um, and listed it by number of accidents and intersections, broken out some of the intersections of, of the use, signalized, non-signalized, arterial, non-arterial. Uh, the data focuses on crashes, inju inju injuries, excuse me, and fatalities. Uh, we've added segments of roadways to the report as well. And then additional data has been included on vulnerable road users, which is our peds and bikes. So it is broken out into eight sections plus an appendix. Um, section one is the long-term trends. Section two notes injuries and fatalities. Uh, we, that's one of the sections we delved, delved into in the accident reports, and we only went back, we only noted a three-year history on that. Next year, when we really support, it'll be a four-year history until we get up to a, a, a running total of five, over five years. Um, it was just a significant amount of staff time to dig into, to, to go back uh, beyond three years. Um, section three is crash incident and timing. Section four is the fatal crash comparison. Section five is the highest injury locations, and those were broken down into, into um, segments and intersections, the regional arterials, which are kind of our state roadways, the city arterials, then city collectors, local streets and collectors. Section six was information on vulnerable road users and high crash locations and segments. Section seven was on impairment and other factors, noting accidents with alcohol, medical, or electronic devices that were relate and related to those kind of three broad topics. Section eight, um, similar to last year's, is we, we went into more detail on some of the fatal crash details. Uh, it's basically an Excel spreadsheet that broke so that we added in the, the 2022 crashes. And then we have an appendix that is basically the raw data of crash tables. So I didn't want to delve into this in this presentation, delve, delve into kind of the individual sections of the report, but I wanted to, to show kind of the, the main trend we're seeing. Um, so in 2022, we saw the uptick uh, from 2021, um, about 1,900 uh, crashes um, on total crashes. Uh, an increase is still a, still a trend going up uh, from the low during COVID of, of a, around, a, around 1,200. Um, but that number is still less than what we had seen in previous years between 2015 to 2019. Um, the um, fatal crashes, or the, I shouldn't say fatals, excuse me, the minor and serious injury crashes, uh, down slightly from um, the 2021 number. Um, and then the fatal was down one year from, from last year's number as well. Um, that is the number in green at the bottom. Um, the report has the, that on the, the index there on that graphic on the on the one section. So just some general information. Um, overall crashes continue to rise. Uh, the injury crashes dropped slightly from 2021. The um, high number crashes um, usually occur between three o'clock and six o'clock p.m. Um, when likely more more road users school lets out um, in that time frame. Um, highest day is usually Friday. Um, and then the highest month, for some reason, is still October. Uh, not sure why. We, we try to delve into uh, looking at that, and we think it's probably because it starts getting darker earlier. Um, maybe you see some more, more, more people out and about. It's football season. Time change. That's later in the month, though. That's in November, pretty much, if I recall. Google that quick. <laughs> Um, and then most crashes we're seeing are, are on the major arterials. Ken Pratt, um, uh, 
It's also 119. Sorry. I didn't, I didn't want to fill it all in. I, I don't want so much room in the slide. Uh, County Road, or State Road, um, Color Road, Road uh, 66 and 287. Those are, you know, high travel roads. Uh, granted, you know, Hover uh, um, gets a lot of accidents. That's up there as well. Uh, city Roadway. Um, but uh, those are where we see the most crashes. You know, not just at intersections, but along, um, along the segments. Um, some of the things we looked at, and I noticed in, I know in last year's report is, uh, Main Street in the downtown area has a lot of, of small scale crashes, um, in part, you know, a lot of, a lot of vehicles on the road and, uh, and parking allowed on, on that road. Um, so we also, uh, this isn't necessarily in included in the report, it's still kind of a work in progress. Um, so we provided some, some kind of, uh, what we call heat mappings. Um, it shows the number of the, the accidents throughout the city for, we did pedestrian, bikes, and fatals. Um, so we're still reviewing the data on this, but we wanted to provide it for you. Um, and these maps are much better viewed at a 20, uh, 24 by 36 when you print them out on a large plotter. Uh, but we'll get these electronically to you when we finalize them. But this is the location of kind of the, the ped, ped, pedestrian accidents. Uh, bicycle accidents. Yeah, they have they have copies of them and the fatal crashes um, for the the time frame that is noted in the report. So on this, uh, in, in closing out this presentation, this is the first draft of this crash report. Um, we're we're really not looking for typos. That's our job to re review those. Uh, it's, this is an overview. Um, and we want to just ask the question, does the report cover the, the things that TAB wants to see? Um, and then kind of asking the question, what has the city done well in the report? And what could staff do better in this report? And those are, that's, that's information that can be brought back at the next TAB meeting, um, give you time to digest it. There's a lot of information in this report um, covering a number of, 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 you know, throughout the city, um, the hundreds of intersections we have, as well as, as you know, you can see the crashes. Um, so with that, I will go to the last slide, which says, thank you. So as I understand it, you'd like us to digest this, come back with comments on the next meeting. I, I think we can, we can ask, answer some, some questions now, but I think, um, like I said, this is this is is a lot of raw data, okay. And we've we've we tried to look at it um, on how it would be helpful as we get into Vision Zero, and looking at at what where are we seeing the most crashes, okay. Um, and 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 where are we going to start prioritizing some of the work we want to do? Now we're going to be starting on that in the the next couple of weeks uh, as we start looking at next year's work plan. Um, and what I what I mean by that is is as we look at some of the roads we're going to going to be working on for asphalt management, okay, our pavement management program. Um, are there roads where we want as we repave those? Do we want to add bike lanes? Do we want to add add uh, curb extensions? Uh, do we want to add in? Um, are we going to look at some intersections for? for stop control. Uh, so we're gonna start that work right now because you know we, we call it the low-hanging fruit. We'll be doing those improvements as part of those other that other work um, to add, you know, make our roads safer. Uh, same would go for Chip Seal, okay, which is what we did with uh, a few years ago with 9th Avenue, and then we also did it last year with 3rd Avenue. This year we really didn't look at any of our uh, collectors or arterials for Chip Seal, so uh, we didn't really incorporate anything for this year. Uh, but next year we'll be looking ahead to that, uh, and then what other improvements we want we may want to do. As we you know as we repave a road, we want to restripe it. Do we want to add in, um, you know, uh, narrower lanes to slow people down? Are we seeing uh, now would be the time to start doing some of the counts uh, to start looking at are we are we seeing people creeping up over the speed limits? Uh, one road I will point to in particular is is Gay Street from 3rd Avenue to 9th is scheduled to be repaved next year. So we're gonna start looking at that. What, how do we, you know, it is a, a enhanced multi-use corridor, but that that plan called for removal of parking from one side of the street, which may not be uh, acceptable to a number of the residents. So we're gonna be meeting in a few weeks to look at what are some of the other options. 
So don't be surprised if we bring back a couple of crazy ideas for you to take a look at before we, uh, we got a little, we got time and now's the time to plan out the, some of the work for next year and incorporate uh, a lot of this information or utilize this information uh, for some of those hotspots we can, we can take care of. Now that, that's not the only work we'd be doing. You know, Kyle also looks at, at, at some of the traffic signals. If we see a lot of left turn incidents, that's gonna be an opportunity to, to, to make those, to, uh, some traffic signals, signalized intersections uh, protected versus, uh, what's the other word? Permissive. Permissive, there you go. Yeah, FYA. Yep, so. I do have a question on the, the Pier City um, comparison chart, which I think is, that's the m really important information in regards to looking at Westminster, Thornton in terms of similar in population, real close in numbers. I'm just curious, do you work at all? And Kyle, I know you came from Thornton, but is there any conversations with, let's say like a Westminster and asking them, what are the challenges that you see with your crash report and see if there's any similarities and or things that they're doing that maybe we could adopt that would be helpful. Uh, yeah, so uh, we have, me personally, I have a pretty good relationship with uh, Thornton and Westminster and uh, their traffic crew over there. Uh, and even my previous position, we talked a lot about the metro area as a whole of how to have different enforcement options and how to um, cooperatively work together to reduce. So big issue was street racing um, so we worked with PD to do some joint task force on those. Um, they are seeing about the similar stuff we're seeing. Um, I will say traveling from place to place, I think every city has kind of a unique flavor of drivers. Um, so it's always a similarity between these cities we see, even if they're a similar population. Uh, but sometimes each city brings its own culture. Uh, and so unfortunately that aspect, sometimes Longmont is unique for just Longmont issues. Oh, Jim, got out of that really fast, huh? See you next meeting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we'll we'll take a look at this. Um, I'm sure as everybody dives into the data, there'll be questions, and I see that there is a quick question here. Um, well, one, I, I do like the report much better than last year, especially the including more of a multimodal data set. Uh, let's see, I'm trying to find it now. Um, I just wonder, you know, I, I, I get it, it's just a lot of data <laughs> and trying to grapple with it and then figuring out what to do in the future. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm just wondering how do we, how do we pri prior, prioritize this, um, especially as, you know, we're trying to re-educate the population and kind of change the paradigm shift of mobility. Um, priority. So, um, I don't. I'm, I'm trying to ask. A, is like, you know, how, how do we? we I, don't, I don't know. I'm. I'm just. I don't, I don't know. I, I'm trying to work my words here. Uh, like, like you know, like leading pedestrian intervals. Is that more of a requirement now, or is that just something that happens as we improve an intersection? Um, yeah, so a lot of this is going to be addressed through our Vision Zero program. Mm -hmm. um, that's really going to start what culture we want in Lamont when it comes to our signalized and unsignalized intersections and mid-block crossings. Um, as far as pedestrian intervals, that's kind of the first step of this uh, traffic signal upgrade project we just started um, through Main Street is once we get this system in, we can really evaluate and change our pedestrian intervals. Uh, it's a limitation we have of our current adaptive system. Um, doesn't give us much control personally, and to make these changes is a lengthy and expensive process. So um, that's kind of why this project was initiated. Um, but as soon as we get do get this um, system up and running and comfortable where it is, uh, it's a system that we really want to push towards having pedestrian safety features integrated with it to really help reduce some of these crashes we're going to be seeing or have seen in the mm -hmm. past. And I know uh, previous month we talked about, well, I know two board members weren't 
too keen on red light cameras, but uh, data from other places that use red light cameras, does that help in terms of safety? Or is it just, you know, we, we get to have a fee? <laughs> um, some of the safety fixes that yeah. we've seen used throughout time, um, the hardest issue is how long does that safety last? Um, I know we get a lot of uh, concerns about increased patrols, having uh, speed trailers put out. They do help mitigate speed in the area, but only temporarily. Um, so things we're trying to really focus on is what are effective methods that would perpetually um, change that driver behavior so that we're not continually just chasing from intersection to intersection. Um, and then we see in our reports every year, it's just a roller coaster of which ones go up, which ones go down. What we really want to see is the entire system as a whole going down. Um, so a big core of our Vision Zero program is going to be data-backed decisions. And with that, we're going to be tracking a lot more in-depth data besides just spot speeds, just spot volumes. Um, our real aim is to create um, a data network of our city so we can really see how those changes affect the city as a whole. So we're not improving safety in one area while degrading safety in another because those aggressive or um, bad behaviors are just being pushed to a different section of town, so. Okay. Um, and then uh, I think uh, another kind of metric is, you know, I, I know that as we plan for the future, we always talk about, you know, potential future, future traffic volumes. I'm sure that's a conversation with CDOT concerning that, you know, I know uh, council and LDDA want to reduce the lane traffic in the downtown area. Um, but then how do we see, you know, we, we see a crash report, but then also preparing for the future of mobility. Are there, uh, I see a confused look. Throw that, throw that one by me again about lane traffic on uh, the LDDA. Well, there was a study session with the LDDA board and council many months ago to advocate for a reduction of lane, bringing, yes. bringing it back back to you know what we had during COVID, uh, where traffic was slowed down uh, in that downtown corridor. So I'm, uh, I'm just wondering, you know, it, we we have a you know we have a crash report, and then we also prepare for future traffic volumes is a key thing. Um, I think a big thing with a crash report is also to look at. Uh, maybe a little bit more that multimodal, but look at the transit use as well, encouraging that. So then it's pulling cars out of the road um, because it seems like cars, you know, they're two tons and they, they're, the, they're the main problem of death. So I'm just curious how we prepare for that future uh, rather than always preparing for more and more cars, if that makes sense. It's a broad, broad question. I'll give you a broad answer. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what, what this crash report focuses kind of on is, is just, as I said, raw data, raw numbers. It's about safety. So what you're asking, I think, is, is beyond that. How do, we, yeah. how do we move from a car-centric society and, and, and push other means of, of, of transportation? Yeah. And I think that's going to get involved into the microtransit. That's going to get involved in maybe expansion of RTD. Uh, it's going to be e-bikes. Um, it's going to be other means, and I think I think part of that needs to be communication, um, and I think and 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 education, and that's going to be a broader picture or, or a, a broader I think program than than what we're talking about here today. Mm -hmm. Okay, and and that's going to be part of Vision Zero, I think. And I think part of that education is to get people out of cars. You know, we're, we're, our direction kind of through the city manager's office and from council is we're not looking at a lot of road, any, any more road widening projects. Okay, on our, our level, we may do some improvements on pace in two years uh, simply to finish the section off. But we're not going to widen the road out for cars. If we widen the road out, it's going to be for, for multimodal facilities. Um, the, the other item is, is maybe maybe we look at Nelson Road as a, as a widening project that's been talked about for a number of years. It's in the, the capital improvement program, but it is not budgeted. Um, but 
I think the the, the kind of what at least the, the this city council's vision has been is pushing for that future of transportation. Um, what's that going to look like? And yeah. and Phil and I have, have have sat in a number of meetings scratching our heads about we don't know what it's going to look like, and but we're going to get there slowly, and I think it's going to be a combination of things, um, and. Uh, you know, that, that can be a further discussion uh, for, for the Transportation Advisory Board as well. Um, yeah. Uh, no, I, I know it is hard. And I know what one council member always brings up, uh, the future thinker, Tony Siba. Yeah. Who, you know, talks about cars took over cities within a decade. And who knows what's coming for our future, so. Yeah, I just I think it's rather eye opening to see the number of bicycle related crashes down Main Street, um, specifically between like, 9th and 17th. And um, I'm mostly shocked just because like I wouldn't wish uh, like biking down Main Street upon my enemy. I mean, it just it's not a good idea to bike down Main Street in the first place. And um, I'm just curious to see if you've thought of any ideas to deter bicyclists on Main Street, like extending the um, dismount zone from like up to like to 17th street or anything to get those bicyclists off of Maine. Yeah, I think what we're looking for is alternatives. So not, not restricting the restrictions on main street. Uh, however you feel about them are, are there because you have front doors that are so close to the sidewalk and as people exit, it gets really dangerous for bicyclists and pedestrians to mix so closely together without separation. So I think the Main Street corridor master or mobility, well, it's a master plan, is really looking at the idea of separation of modes along those other stretches of Main Street. And we're also building, um, we should have, we talked about not widening roads, but we are trying to build a better connected system. And so up there at 15th and 16th and Main, there is a, a portion of, uh, not Kaufman, but Terry that's gonna go through in the back. And so that'll offer some options for people to be able to go, you know, use the Main Street corridor. So within, you know, a couple blocks of the of Main Street. We're also talking about actually on Main Street within the right of way, uh, that, that corridor plan has some options as well for some of that. And you'll see more of that as we start to talk about bus rapid transit, uh, mid-block signal crossings, or, rapid, or rectangular, rectangular rapid flashing beacons. I like to say the whole thing for some reason because I never get it right. But um, we're talking about those different things to also help people move up and down Main Street without using Main Street, without using the street. Um, like you said, you'd never want to bicycle that. Um, but we do have a lot of people who bicycle on the, on the sidewalks. So how do we separate that? So that's what we're looking at is different options to get people either a block or two off of Main Street or enhance the facilities that we have on Main Street to make it uh, easier for bicyclists to, to use and safer. Um, can I have a copy of the crash report, please? Uh, so just to clarify, all the pedestrian and bicycle um, crashes and fatalities also involve a vehicle. It sounds reasonable, but sometimes it's a bicycle pedestrian. We're, we're, we're pretty sure it's true. Um, okay. And the reason I'll, 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 I'll say that it is... Um, when you had asked me a few months ago about, about a, the pedestrian accident uh, with a train on 119, that never made it into a crash report because it wasn't a vehicle. So we had, when we were looking in records, we didn't have a, a crash report of that. We knew it occurred because it was in the press and, and we, we'd heard about it. But So um, these will all involve a, a bike and a motor vehicle. Okay. Also, how long has Boulder been um, participating in Vision Zero? 
Does anybody know? I think it's only been about four to five years. Okay. And, and then, they, and oh, then, good. do you have any data about uh, how many? Um, I'm sorry. How many? This must be an issue tonight, Taylor. But how many? How many vehicles are actually going through these towns? Because I see that you know it's based on the population, but as we know, there's a lot of people that pass through Longmont. There's a lot of people that uh, drive to Boulder. So I'd be interested. I would be interested to know how many um, actually transportation, you know, miles they have on their streets. I wonder if that's something that the um, their transportation department keeps. I think, as I recall, Boulder does publish vehicle miles traveled in their community, I think as part of Vision Zero. I'm not sure. We'd have to be, be delving into to each of those um, those cities, but that would that might be good information to have as a, as just a comparison, because I know that that we we see a lot of of commuter traffic coming north this through south and then east to west, east to west in the mornings and west to east in the evening. So, um, you know, I know that that some of the the uh, um, it is, and it's also kind of a it's a lot of projections because it's going to be difficult to have without. You know, having accurate counts on on your major arterials and other streets, um, and I know we're working on it with the new signal system on Main to get kind of that will be able to be recorded as part of those new camera systems. So, nice. um, but um, we'll 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 try to see if we can put some stuff together for it. Just real quick for your uh, for City of Boulder, I just found it online is 2014, so they've been incorporating Vision Zero since 2014. Okay. And then whenever we talk about the through traffic, we actually did a survey about 10 years ago, and we're surprised to see that most trips along Main Street, Hover, and 119 actually had a stop in Longmont. So only about, I think it was less than 10%, were not stopping in Longmont for, at all. They were, they may have been through trips and not, you know, mm -hmm. their, yeah. their origin and destination were not in Longmont or their final origin and final destination were not in Longmont, but the, there was some stop that was made in Longmont. So I'm not sure how to, if that helps or hinders your question, but it does tell you a little bit more of the story that even though people are traveling through, typically they'll make a stop for something. Like 10 years ago. Right. Consider the development of Frederick and Southside Junction was done in 100 years ago. It could very well change those numbers, but then you also think about, well, we have a new Costco. We have new mm -hmm. shops along, you know, that are more popular. We have different restaurants. We have things like that that are maybe more attractive to people for, to stop. A couple Starbucks, you know, have come up. So it's all those different factors that kind of factor in. It would be really interesting. I think we're going to have much better data as we get into the more uh, electronic age rather than stopping people and asking them questions on the side of a road. I think we can actually get better, better data coming up here in the future. Okay, so I just want to bring to the board's attention that Boulder is doing quite a bit better than we are in their fatal crashes. And they had one-seventh of the fa fatal crash in 2022 because they only had one and we had seven. But if you look at the prior years, it's um, it's been really good for five years. And their five-year average is a 2.4 considering their population is very similar to ours. And I just wondered, I wondered if they had been participating in Vision Zero or if it had to do with the fact that their streets are more narrow, the fact, you know, and I'm, I think it was a combination of things, but it might, might be worthwhile to study a bit what, what has led them to a better result. No, not really. <laughs> well, one of the things I'll note is, is on our report, um, we do include the state roadways. Uh, which we have limited control over. Um, and now I know that, that a few few months ago or a few years last year, what was it, Newark? No, Newark was touting that they had reached zero accidents on their roads, but they didn't count the state roadways within their community. Um, so we, in, in our group, we, we include Main Street, we include 119, we include 66. Um, but one thing to add, uh, kind of 
quick changing topics back to uh, vehicle miles traveled. Um, you know, we are, well, we're moving forward right now with an adaptive, a new adaptive signal system on Main Street. We have future plans to um, change out the adaptive signal system on Hover as well as 119. So that, that same system that will allow us to, to note those vehicle miles traveled will be uh, within the next two years, I think, at the schedule, um, on 119 and Hover, which are, again, highly traveled roads. So, you know, as we build that, 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 that database of, of both accidents, you know, miles traveled or vehicles on the road, speeds, um, that's all part of, you know, kind of that uh, um, network, data network we'll build through Vision Zero. And part of that is, is in data collection, we'll be hiring another staff member next year uh, for that, as well as another planner. Um, the current status real quick on that is that uh, we are getting ready to recruit for uh, the uh, kind of the Vision Zero Manager transportation planner this year. Uh, currently, it's getting held up in HR. I checked. Um, so we're trying to move that, cut that free so we can start recruiting on that. Thanks, and then uh, you reminded me, Jim, that um, I noticed there are two fatal crashes on North Main, north of 66, and the business uh, uh, businesses up on North Main mentioned that people just come down 287 and try to run into Longmont as fast as they can in their cars, and they were saying that it would be nice to have some mitigation, you know, maybe starting around Walmart just to slow them down by the time they get to town. I do notice there were two fatal crashes there, so I thought, well, that reminds me of that topic. So I just want to bring your attention that, that Boulder County, in conjunction with the CDOT and a number of the, the communities, has been working on uh, the 287 corridor. I think they're about to release their report. In fact, I think we just got the draft yeah. this afternoon. Um, so we'll look at that to see if they, they are proposing um, any mitigation measures. I, I think they were talking about at least north of, of the city, some, some uh, um, barriers, median barriers to restrict kind of the, the crossover traffic. Um, but they, I, I think we saw in the paper a week ago another accident north of the city. Um, so we'll, we'll take a look at that and then see, see what that, that shows us. Uh, but that is a concern is I think as soon as you leave, you you ex you get off of north of 66, it goes to 55 miles per hour, I believe, going northbound, mm -hmm. and then to 65. So, um, yeah, an area of concern, and particularly in light of the fact that, in case you didn't know already, there's some development coming in north of that traffic signal that's still in the city, uh, an annexation, as well as that northeast corner is they're looking to develop. So there will be increased traffic in. You know, if you look at development taking about three to four years in the next four or five years out there. Yeah. So backing it up to Walmart or earlier to slow yep. people down a little fast or a little sooner. All right. Thanks, Jim. <clears throat> um, I just had a couple couple of items. Jim, you mentioned the no road no road widening projects and Hopefully the board appreciates that's a very huge step by the city to say we're not going to widen roads. So I commend you on being able to kind of, I'll say, plant that flag, at least for, for now. Because um, I know road design, road diets, all that effectively can help uh, regulate speed and that sort of a thing. And we're talking about speed control as we were earlier. Um, I noticed, you know, Boulder might have also a little bit better track record based on network of streets and how it's designed, obviously narrower streets, as well as they have red light cameras, right? So that effectively does help folks realize that they can't kind of do stupid things in intersections because they're going to be on camera. Um, again, is that something that's even been talked about at council level in terms of um, enforcement? I know that's not speed control, but that's more, more of enforcement. Red light cameras? Um, I think that's an issue that I would not want to speak to that without public safety chiming in. I believe that they have been looking at it. Um, that is something I think they have budgeted in this year's budget as well as carrying over to next year. Um, and it is, I think, one of the challenges they've been looking at that um, if you hire, like kind of in most cases, an outside vendor, at least for those like those red light portable speed trailers type things, they, are, they do not come inexpensive. They are not cheap. 
Um, and it's just some other one of the items that I think that 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 we still leave in the, in the toolbox for now, and and it, it's an item to flesh out uh, as we do the action plan in 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 the coming year. So it is still on the table. Yes. Good. And. Not to put you on the spot, Kyle, but I know you meet with public safety on a regular basis. Is there talk about looking at certain arterials, corridors that you want to do? You would like to see speed enforcement because you know from at least anecdotally from crash reports as well as otherwise from complaints from um, residents where you'd like to see maybe some temporary speed enforcement or even just show of, you know, police are on the road. Obviously, that slows people down. I was just curious your thoughts on that. Yeah, so um, I'm a strong believer in cooperation with our police and enforcement and having more targeted enforcements that can help both of us mitigate speeds. Um, we have been working this last year. PD did purchase some mobile uh, speed radar signs that we've been actually moving throughout the city. Um, we've had them at 8th Avenue and Main Street, which seemed pretty effective. And if you notice, there is a permanent one there now coming into 8th. Uh, we did see some great feedback on that, getting people to slow down as they enter that downtown area, being so dense as it is. Uh, but we have rotated those through 9th Avenue, 11th. Um, we have plans to put them on our major arterials where you see most of our segment accidents. So, you know, 17th, Pace, Main Street, um, and then wherever where we feel that there's some temporary need for it or um, some data collection as well. Okay, um, any other questions on the crash report? Or we can move on. No action items? Okay, so we'll do uh, comments from the board. We'll start with uh, board member Kim. Um, uh, to an earlier point, I live right there at, on the east side, so I hear, like, all night, zooming back and forth, so I 100% am looking forward to possibly some mitigations there, because, uh, it's just a straight shot, so, and there is new development happening over there, too. And for people like me who like just walk around that area, it is kind of dicey. So I'm very happy to hear that uh, there's progress moving there. And I just had a general question too, um, regarding you know the new developments. Um, when does data start being collected in these new areas that are currently being in the process being built right now? Uh, what kind of data are you specifically maybe asking about? Is it pedestrian, traffic, speed? Is there a specific type of data set you like to see or hear about? I'm not 100% sure, but a lot of the info here is really, like, insightful. So I guess, yeah, uh, incidents involving non, I mean, isn't that the point? Like, all of this data is gathered from, you know, versus vehicular um, vehicles, right? So... Yeah, information about, I'm not sure actually. <laughs> uh, so in accordance with our, our, our municipal code for most developments, developments of a certain size, they are required to submit um, a traffic impact study. Mm -hmm. And that will we'll note um, with uh, um, and I'm probably going to have Caroline come up and, and, and delve into that a little deeper uh, on what the requirements are in an impact study. Mm -hmm. uh, but it usually shows the levels of service at, at intersections, the, the trip generations coming off the road, it project mm -hmm. off the development, it projects mm -hmm. kind of uh, where those those trips might, might be traveling. Mm -hmm. um, there is uh, um, prior to um, almost every um, development coming in, we sit down with them, do a scoping meeting. Mm -hmm. So if there's certain certain requirements or certain items we may need, the, the city may need because of resident outcry, um, uh, 
you know, uh, or incidents we've seen, we may ask for additional additional analysis and study. And then usually it comes in in an annexation, uh, so we can see that it'll it'll note where their 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 access points are, uh, how it how it impacts the surrounding uh, area. Um, and then we I think we ask for uh, maybe an update uh, when they come in later on for their uh, their development plans uh, are submitted. So we do see a traffic impact study. Um, if you're interested in any of those, they are public documents. Um, so once they're pretty much finalized, they're they're open for for public scrutiny. Awesome, thank you. Love the maps, and it's a very well done report. Actually, could really compare data. I just wanted to share with the board a little bit of uh, personal experience, and that is, I think I mentioned in June I had an accident on 119, and so I've been, uh, just have had back pain, so I've been doing an, uh, chiropractic and what have you. But they've kept me off my bike, which has ma made it hard for me to connect with the bus. But then also, I didn't have a car for two months, so I was borrowing rides, and I was, you know, just kind of, thumbing it down here. And and then also, you know, just driving was a little bit painful for a while, too. So I, my husband has another truck, but you know how a truck runs. So I was like, oh, okay. Um, and I, it just was a big eye-opener in terms of how hard it is to get around this town nowadays. Um, and it's about a mile for me to catch the bus. So, um, so very psyched about microtransit. I think we're on the right track. I felt this was field experience to me to learn how other people are, you know, getting around all the way downtown. So just wanted to share that. So just a perspective. Um, thank you guys for all you're doing. I think we're on the right track. And uh, we're really getting some good data here. So we'll know where we start. And we can map our progress. Uh, <coughs> you know, th thank you for the report. It um, you know, like I said, I like the multimodal part uh, to get that data in. Uh, because the level of service was kind of mentioned, I am curious, uh, does that do our level of service, are we only looking at roadway when that data comes out, or are we looking at, you know, even pedestrian safety? Like, in other words, what, what level of service is safest for a, a cyclist and a pedestrian? It's a curious question of mine. So the level of service I was speaking of is it is it intersections and it is mostly for um, for vehicular traffic, okay, stipulated in, in time delays, mm -hmm. uh, with an A B C D E, middle or an E, E rating. Um, so um, and that that's kind of the standard that that's in our, our or that is in our standards uh, what we follow. Um, you know, we, we've looked at, have, have, have thrown ideas around of, of what are we looking at for capacity of roadways? What are we looking at for time-based travel uh, delays across the city? Um, so, you know, you know, that's what we have to work with, with the require, you know, kind of required ease according to our standards. I don't see why that wouldn't change in the future, particularly as we go into the action plan. Um, but we, you know, uh, we may factor in pedestrian uh, incidents or bicycles. Uh, we're starting to see more of that now, uh, but that's not necessarily noted in the in our standards for what is required in a in an impact study. Okay, and then, uh, um, well, yeah, I, I can't talk at all this tonight. Um, <laughs> uh, I would I would also second board member Chris. Uh, you know, being in a car accident you know, isn't fun. I, I've been in one as well. And then I just think of, you know, for getting basic necessities being without a car. Um, so that's why I am extremely hopeful for the microtransit B cycle uh, and, and hopefully a little bit more uh, land use changes to maybe allow that walkability throughout town as well. Uh, so I'm extremely hopeful for, for our future here in town. Thank you. That's very insightful. Thank you for your uh, your time putting it together. Um, I'm excited to look at this data over the next month. Um, I think it also gives a good insight of uh, how we can make marked progress. Um, and I look forward to uh, Longmont like uh, 
being more safer than cities like Fort Collins and Broomfield. And uh, yeah, like that'll be like a victory. So like now I have like a goal of like, what does Vision Zero look like? So thank you for your time. Yeah, just reiterate the um, crash data, putting this all together, I know is a big, big lift every year. Um, and I do like that, that last section, that's great. So look at it, have comments, I'm sure, in the next meeting, and that jumps to items for the upcoming agenda. Phil, do you have anything in regards to that? I've been furiously writing down a lot of things, yeah. <laughs> let, me, uh, let me go through the list here. It's, it's not too bad, actually. So, so in November, we plan to come back with the crash report part two. So you talked about that, which is great. Um, I would like to just update you with flex ridership because we said in the work plan that we would do that. And so I want to make sure, regardless of kind of how important that is to folks, at least we'll get the information to you and you can kind of delve into it and we'll just see uh, if we want to talk about that uh, next year as well. But that kind of brings up that in December, we would like to do the work plan and get that finalized. Uh, front range passenger rail, we've got some folks who are interested in that, so I want to make sure that we're covering front range passenger rail and just kind of the, the different things that are going on there. There's been a lot of updates and maybe that's more of an item from staff, but we want to make sure we bring that to you. And then we typically bring the traffic safety fund report. So that's that you know, $5 that's collected on each ticket and what that's being spent on and how we're using that money. So I just want to make sure we're reporting that to you as well. And then that, that usually goes to city council as well. So we'll ask for your recommendation on that. So those are the kind of the five things I have written down for the next two months. F, well, November and December. Great, Thanks. thank you. Okay, um, unless there's anything else, I need a motion to adjourn. Oh, yeah. I forgot to mention that I, I participated in the budget um, sessions with the city council. And just after our uh, September meeting, I know um, board member McInerney was concerned about um, certain items in the, in the transportation budget that they met the requirement of the street fund. So I just brought, I just represented for the board and said, you know, that we had some concerns about that, but um, the alternative to some of those capital improvements would be they would come out of the general fund. So, I mean, they have to be paid somewhere. So I think maybe that's something we could discuss later if, if uh, board member McInerney is still unsatisfied. And I just wanted to throw that in. Thanks. Okay, um, so I'll need a motion to adjourn tonight. I move to adjourn the meeting. <laughs> All those in favor, say aye. 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 Okay, meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much.